we're gonna get into our panel now. But first, let me just introduce our moderator for today. This is gonna be Nicole Perryman. She is the CEO and Executive Director of iFerrata. Be short and sweet. Thank you so much. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for all coming this evening to talk about a very important topic, um, black mental health. Sorry, I'm spotlighting at the same time. Someone else wants to do that. <laughs> um, it's a very important topic because for many reasons. And today we're hopefully going to get into conversations around the importance of centering a whole week on talking about Black mental health, centering on what we need as a community um, in terms of our mental wellness, in terms of our everyday life experiences, but also how we deal with distress and situations where mental health becomes really unwell. Um, I really love the comments in the post around, you know, how do we find support? How do we um, get the cultural support that we need? As well as um, creating space to talk about what those experiences are like. We have um, some great panelists today who will not only speak about, you know, their expertise within the field, but also their experiences, experiences that hit to their heart. Um, I do want to apologize, I don't have the bio, so Nadise, if you wanted to read the bios of the group, and then we'll get started. Yes. Give me one second, I have it here. Okay, cool. so we have Crystal Hines. Crystal Hines is an advocate, educator, and consultant who's focused on equity, anti-oppression, and anti-racism. She works with individuals, communities, and organizations with an expertise on youth and women to cultivate equitable and anti-oppressive policies, programs, and practices that promote community-centric leadership to build sustainable systems and communities. After working for eight years in, in sectors like education, mental health, and youth justice, she has observed patterns and practices that make these institutions inaccessible for marginalized communities. She works alongside various communities and individuals with the ultimate goal of transforming sectors. We have also Stefan Linton. Awesome. Stephen? Steven. Oh, welcome. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, we have Stefan Linton. Stephen. Uh, Stephen, my bad. My apologies. Okay. <laughs> Stephen Linton has over 15 years of community development experience working all over Toronto, including Centennial College, Toronto District School Board, Metrolinx, and the City of Toronto. He is a community advocate and resident of Durham Region who applies his knowledge and experience to support and enhance the lives of marginalized and equity-deserving populations. As an avid volunteer in Durham, he initiates activities such as civic engagement and recre recreational programs and is currently a community committee member with the Pickering Library Anti-Black Racism Work Group, anti, uh, yeah, Anti-Black Racism Work Group. <laughs> so welcome, Stephen. Welcome. And then we also welcome Natasha Holiday. Natasha Holiday, M-A-C-Y-C-P-R-S-W, is a therapist, speaker, comedian, and author. She has worked supporting individuals with their mental health for over 20 years. She is currently supports individuals with their mental health through her practice. She has spoken at mental health forums, addressing a variety of, of areas of mental health, including mental health in the Black community. Natasha is passionate about helping people unmask fear, overcome adversity, manage burnout, and build and foster resilience. Welcome, Natasha, and welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you, thank you. So welcome. Um, I know I had a list of questions for us uh, to kind of think about, but I really do encourage an organic conversation. So as much as possible, you know, if something comes up for you or stirs for you, please, you know, feel free to share it. And as well for the audience who's listening, if there's something, a burning question that you have, feel free to use the chat or the question, the answer, and we'll do our best to respond to your questions. We also have Nadis and Teja, who are tech support today. So they will also be supporting in this process. 
Um, before we started, I had two questions. I had a couple questions for everybody. And honestly, I don't even know which question it is. Let me see. It's not this one. I'm ending this one. All right, let's end it. Th it's this one. So it's just checking questions to see how, where people are in the group, in the community. So if you see these questions, please respond. The first question, just wanted to know who here has black or African ancestry. Um, we also wanted to know, do you or a family member experience difficulties with their mental health? Um, it's a really important question only just to, to land who is our audience and who is here. And the last question, what are your biggest concerns about mental health? And of course I came up with some ideas, but if there's other things that are not listed here, please feel free to use the chat to share your perspective. And thank you for those who are sharing. I'm gonna shut it off and shut it down, shut it um, in 30 seconds, maybe 10 seconds. So thank you for those who participated. Thank you, thank you. And okay, got some more. All right, so I'm going to stop the poll, but also to share it with everyone to give everyone with an idea of what the results look like. So all of the participants um, identified today that they have um, Black or African ancestry. Um, when it comes to family members experiencing mental health difficulties, 67% of us um, shared yes, and I'm sure the panelists as well maybe have ideas as well too. So a large group of us. Um, and the last one is, what are our biggest concerns? And we seem really mixed on these results, but um, no resources, risk of life. So we're talking about suicide, um, drug abuse, stigma within the community, lack of affordable options, and just not sure. So I appreciate everyone for sharing um, their thoughts. And I don't know if one of the panelists have thoughts about what uh, came up for the poll for everybody. Any thoughts? What's your first initial like, whoa? Is this a surprise for you or is this what you're seeing in the community? I, I can say I'm not surprised by what I saw, um, especially despite every new program that comes out, there's still difficulty with accessing. The demand still outweighs um, the supply. So I know it's, it's challenging for people to access, especially culturally, relevant culturally competent services, people who look like them so they don't have to spend time justifying their experience as a Black person. So um, I'm I'm unfortunately surprised. Yeah, me too. Thank you for sharing. Tasha, I'll let you go first. What is some of the work that you're doing in the community and what are you passionate about? So I currently have a private practice um, as a therapist and I also do public speaking on a variety of mental health topics um, and where I can, I try to volunteer for different um, uh, organizations or um, I can't think of the word that I need, but different um, ideas that come up that might be, you know, time sensitive. Um, what I'm passionate about, I'm just passionate about people, especially our people, um, because we, especially living in, in Canada where you know, every day you might have to do extra work just because of the skin you're in. You have to justify your experience. You might be denied your experience. Like I've had people tell me who are not black that something I experienced was racist was not racist. And I'm like, you can't tell me that. You haven't walked in my shoes. You don't know what it's like to experience that. And when I talk to my clients and talk to people in general, I hear the same story over and over again about having to try to justify your experience as somebody walking in black skin and it's unfortunate that as many advances as we've made in 2024 we're still fighting this battle and there's still so much work to do um but in terms of what i'm passionate about i'm really just passionate about helping people 
in whatever ways I see fit. One of the things I'm very grateful for is because I am a Black woman, I can bring the lens of being somebody who's Black. I'm of Caribbean descent, obviously African descent, um, bigger picture, but my parents are from the Caribbean, but I can bring that perspective. And so people can, you know, maybe find it easier to identify with because of that, or, you know, seek services and understand that there's things that I may get as a result of that. Um, so I'm really passionate about being supportive to all people, but especially to people within our community. Thank you, Natasha. And I just want to say that you were, you have always been there for us as a Kajanga community. You've shown up on this panel discussion many years at a time. So I just want to thank you for your dedication. And we see you and we hear you. So thank you so much. Crystal, what are you passionate about? Tell us about your community work. Hello, good evening, everyone. First of all, Natasha, when I heard that you're a comedian, I was like, pause, pause the whole panel. Because if my if my family at barbecues laughed at a couple more of my jokes, I wouldn't have been in this field. So, <laughs> so kudos, you just inspired that part of me. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Um, so in terms of my community work, so I am the program development manager for the Developing Child and Youth Advocacy Center for Durham Region, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, I'm also a therapist um, and I work out with, with the firm Mississauga that particularly focuses on the mental health of folks from the diaspora, but also serves everyone. And then as mentioned, I, I'm a consultant and do some education in public speaking and so forth. And all of my work is really centered um, around anti-oppressive, anti-racism practice, which you know is the kind of rhetoric we use to frame some of the issues that we'll be talking about today. But at my core, I'm passionate about freedom. Um, and I'm passionate about a particular type of freedom. When we think about freedom, it necessitates us to trace back our history of bondage. Um, and I'm not just talking about um, slavery, I'm talking about like the colonial state, the colonial project, you know? I'm in my master's of social work right now. My entire um, focus of my research is on the penal system. And in doing that research, it's, it, I, I've been reintroduced to the reality that we don't just have a carceral system, we live in a carceral state of mind, of body. Um, and my interest in freedom particularly necessitates me to dive deeper into the margin of those who have been denied freedom. And so even Mag, your indigenous sister earlier, who was um, sharing the beautiful opening, it reminds me of how the liberation of black people is always going to be intertwined with the liberation of indigenous peoples, right? And our freedom and as, a, as a necessary coalition is also going to always be intertwined into the freedom of humanity. Um, you know. We hear it all the time by the the greats, you know, the Angela Davises, the Asata Shakars, the uh, many of the political prisoners who sacrificed for us to be where we are in this moment in time. Um, and when we think about the concepts of reimagining and all of those pieces, I always want to beg the question, you know, whose imagination are we living in? Because that in and of itself reveals a particular type of freedom. I want the type of freedom where, not to say I don't want these panels to happen, but where we don't have to have so many conversations about Black mental health, where we don't have to have conversations about disparity rates, where we don't don't have to have specialized services because it is normalized and naturalized that Black people get to be free in how we think and how we feel and how we express. Um, and the last thing I'll just say, just I didn't mention it, but it came after um, hearing Natasha speak just about that, the, the uh, feedback that came on the poll, is I always think about the intersectional pieces. I always think about, yes, we, the, you know, we can acknowledge that we are all of African descent but then i think about black um black women you know black trans folks black disabled people and who are missing from these equations because even within our communities we struggle to define what freedom means for everyone and so yeah that's me. thank you crystal oh my god i was looking for like emojis like i just thank you thank you so much and wow i appreciate you sharing and i I was almost envisioning like what does freedom look like for us so i appreciate that and i've known you for i don't even think you know how long i've known you for but just watching you um it's it's inspiring thank you so much you're remarkable and mr stephen linton welcome thanks for having me what are you passionate about tell us about your work uh, what am i passionate about um Community voice, having our voices heard, having our voices at the right table. Um, you know, in, in the bio, it spoke about like community development and being a community development practitioner. Um, and throughout my career, I've had the privilege um, of sitting at many tables and then understanding 
um, where the decisions are made and striving to be a voice and that voice and get more voices um, at those tables, um, you know, through the support of, of family and, and people like yourselves. I've had the chance to um, represent our community at many tables and open the door. But now it's about keeping that door open and allowing more members of our community to walk through. So my passion really is around community voice and it's incredible even, you know, with some of the tables that I sit with based on um, the title, how many don't want to hear that community voice. It's like, no, 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 we've got it. I've spoken to like five people, boom, that is Durham. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna create strategies. We're gonna create programs based on those five people who all happen to be from Whitby, right? Um, but that is not the representation of, of who we are. We are diverse, we are beautiful, we are excellent, we are experienced. Um, we have not only thrived but survived many challenges even in today's society um, and our stories continue need to continue to be told um, there's that phrase of standing on the um, shoulders um, of our ancestors and we are in the phase where we're starting to be and go towards that ancestor status so it's about how do we help some of our, the rest of our community especially our young people start to become that voice so the passion really is how do we open the door how do we keep it open how do we get our people confident to be in these forums and continue to speak up for what our needs are in a today context. Thank you. It's definitely, I could see that passion. I was just reflecting, okay, I've also known you a very long time. You probably don't know since like 2008 and from very, yeah. And from then you were in the community. And so it definitely has continued and you're right, how do we pass it on to the next generation? How do we continue this, this work that we're doing, this good work that we're doing? <sighs> so we'll start with, I feel like we've kind of answered it, but I'll start with Stephen. Why do we need to have these conversations about race and identity? Why do we need to be here today? Um, you know, it's like when thinking about the question, it was reflect how we've come. And I think sometimes we don't give ourselves enough credit for how far we've come. Um, you know, we, we do see egregious acts um, of violence against our, our people and we have protested and we have fought and we have gone in and we've changed policies. Um, again, we are now at the tables. We are MPPs, we are school board trustees, we are city councillors. Um, and there was a lot of resilience because people are still looking at us and saying, no, you're at this right they're still treating us and it's the majority as much as we're together as a community and we see us there are still the majority of decision makers still don't look like us the majority of people who are enforcing rules against us don't look like us um the majority of those who are hiring or not hiring us don't look like us so we are still battling and we are still struggling um but we seem to do it on our own Right, we, we seem to take this on and we don't access the supports that are, are there. Um, you know, Durham Community Health Centre have um, a, I think it's the Tuesdays or Thursdays where they have a black doctor on site where you can go and have engaging conversations and dialogue. And I've been there three times and every time I've gone, the waiting room has been essentially empty. Wow. And these are the resources, these are conversations and these are people who look like us. We're not asking for someone who looks like us. Now there's someone who looks like us and we're not utilizing um, those services. So that strive, you know, that goal to be the first to keep those doors open, do have a strain on us, right? We, we go in and we are in meetings and we are networking and we are smiling when we don't want to smile and we're eating food that we really don't want to be eating and then we're walking through the door at 10 o'clock and we are mashed and then we get back up at eight o'clock and do it all over again because we know the importance of being there so you know having these conversations is important because you know it truly impacts our research you know i again was mentored by a phenomenal man, Sean Rose um, from Malvern, who you know spoke to our greatness and was supportive. But you know, there was still that stress of bringing so many people up, and he did it continuously with a smile on his face. But 
how many people were able to go and have a conversation with him about that strain of being that person. Um, so we've got to keep talking about it. What I'll say again, and maybe to Crystal's point, we don't want to be here. We want to be here. We want to spend time with you before you're phenomenal. But we don't want to be here because we don't want to continue having these conversations. But right now, because we haven't quite solved it, it's really important to keep talking. Yeah, I agree. We haven't solved it. I think there's a lot of maybe exhaustion about talking about it or people feeling that we shouldn't have these conversations. We haven't fixed the race problem yet. But I have, similar to you, I have lots of fear that we're going to get to a certain point and then we're stopped. We're not going to talk about this anymore. And the issues and the challenges that we face with Black people will continue um, to impact us, to cause death, to disrupt families. You know, we've seen the impact, right? So stream young people into prison. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, we do need to have those conversations and continue to do so. Um, Sorry, Nadis put in the chat the link for the Durham Community Health Center um, for anyone who's interested. Yes, it is quite empty. Um, and I think us using the community resources will be helpful. But I also hope that Durham Community Health Center also knows that it's going to take time for us to buy into their services, right? And sometimes building trust is, is what takes time. I'm moving along, but if you, if anyone wants to like jump out, like feel free to, to um, say something that's on your heart or something that comes up for you as we're having these conversations. Um, we chatted about this before with the poll, but for Natasha, what are some of the themes that you've been noticing with families that you're working with, with children, with youth surrounding mental health? What is coming up for you? Um, I noticed several themes. One of the themes is um, between parents and children, where, um, you know, I'm a first generation Canadian. And I remember like my parents, there was no talking about mental health. And so often there's a bit of a disconnect between uh, countries of origin and ways of navigating or not maybe acknowledging mental health quite as much and the way that it's seen and acknowledged in Canada and trying to bridge that gap so that parents have an understanding of their children's experiences. And, and I see a lot of families that definitely want to support, but they're trying to support without having understanding. And so I think we both have to educate parents and provide support to children and to parents as well. Um, and then another theme that I see is all the stressors that everyone in the world is facing and then you act, compound that by the racism the systemic issues that we deal with and adding that weight to already stressful situations and people are trying to navigate and face all these things and a lot of people are struggling they don't know how to do all of that because if you try to advocate in your workplace you're often fearful of the backlash of speaking up if you um, are honest about maybe an inappropriate experience at your children's school, you don't know that it's going to help. You don't want your child to face backlash and to be treated more poorly as a result. And so, you know, these are ongoing things that we're facing. So it's almost like we're on edge all the time to some degree because we're like, we want to be able to advocate for ourselves, but even with advocating, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to see the change that we want. And so it feels like, um, you know, a tremendous use of energy that we're not necessarily seeing the fruition of what we want from it. And it becomes very difficult because we have a system that benefits from, it's, it's this system benefits from the way that it is. The people that are in charge are still benefiting from it. So they don't really want it to change. And what we see instead is a bunch of things, ways we are appeased and they think that they're, you know, they throw things out to make themselves feel better but it's not exacting and long lasting change. And so when you, when I, sometimes when I see what it takes to create long lasting change, you see all the red tape organizationally, you see the pushback, you see the ways that they're going to try to downplay what we're doing, discard us, all these different things so that really people who are benefiting from it can stay in their comfort zones, but it makes it just that much harder for us to navigate. So those are some of the themes that I see. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, uh, uh, Stephen and Crystal can also add to that, but that's just some of the stuff that I would see. Thank you for sharing. I think the anti-Black racism piece, it's huge, right? And it's not always discussed or talked about or the center of our conversations. 
Um, as you were sharing that, I, I want to pull up this quote um, that was written in 2002. And the writer says, to oppress a race and then label its reaction as mental illness is not only morally wrong, it's criminal and a fraud. And that speaks to our experiences of our children from the time they enter school, like you talked about. It speaks to our young people as they're before, I was gonna say magistrate, oh my God, I don't know where that came from. Before the, they're before the judge and they're, you know, being sentenced for crimes that are, are dealing with mental health. Um, it's for our families when there's separation or discord in families, right? Um, that's the themes that we're seeing is, is very much how anti-Black racism plays out in the day-to-day -day world. And also the conflict between families and then how do people navigate that if they don't understand the differences between African-centered ways of living and Caribbean ways of living and how that comes in conflict with Canadian ways of living, right? Crystal, I feel like yeah. you have something to say. <laughs> I did. I unmuted myself, and then I was like, oh, hold on. <laughs> oh, no. no, I <laughs> thank you so much, Natasha. Um, uh, I, I have so many thoughts on this piece, but the two things um, that come to mind is also, you know, I know we're talking about the systemic implications of anti-Black racism and how it shows up in the way we live, but I think a pat theme that I've seen in my practice is also how um, the somatic piece and how anti-blackness shows up in the body you know we always we talk about internalized depression as this idea in which we internalize the beliefs and attitudes of anti-black racism and project them as our own but internalized depression can also show up in the form of hyper surveillance internally right and so natasha when you talk about that sense of being on guard all the time and you know steven you touched on this too even in the like why we need to talk about mental health and race is that those two systems will or and, and ideas will always intersect and black people don't have the freedom of getting to just think about their mental health because yes if a mother is going through something and wants support from child welfare she's also going has to recognize she's going to be criminalized that child welfare in many ways also acts as, as as police and institutions and while there have been transformative processes and projects in place that have come to combat those things it doesn't change the intrinsic root of that and i've seen that manifest in in the ways that people um emotionally people develop physical ailments because of it or they have existing ailments that turn into long-term chronic like pain and and so forth and it's intergenerational whose whose body did this exist in beforehand right and so i think when we look at some of those themes like it's not it's not a coincidence that in 2020 um anti-black racism was deemed um a, a huge determinant of health because it is literally deteriorating our bodies but something i also want to reinforce is this reality that these things are not coincidental colonial state colonial violence and colonial subjugation again remember colonialism is about displacement separation dispossession and subjugation in order for that system to persist it must persist on the foundation it was built on therefore anti-black racism anti-indigeneity systemically and interpersonally is a necessary condition for this colonial state to persist so when we see organizations pursuing initiatives and stuff to combat racism or or, or let's call it out like these edi initiatives that are designed to see us but also surveil us right there's a cap to that because we can only give them so much freedom before we have to maintain this the colonial project that is white supremacy right and so the themes i think i always say to my clients the personal is political what you're experiencing externally and in your body is not separate and i want you to see that because if we can see it and we can call it out then we can begin to disrupt it in a very intentional way thank you crystal we are having a chat on wednesday at noon um, and our speaker is Melissa Taylor, and she's really talking about the somatic experience. So thank you for that. Um, also resources, I love Resma Menikin. I don't know if anyone's heard of him. He's got some amazing um, talks on YouTube and really talks about that body supremacy and that body impact, not only for us, but also for white people too, who hold bodies of power, right? Um, Steven, what do you wanna share? What came up for you? So much again, um, and you know, as, as Crystal was speaking, um, the, the thought that came up is, you know, mental health is second, third or fourth to everything else. I don't have the time to worry about my mental health because I've got a blank, 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 blank. I don't have time to worry about this because I've got a blank, 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 blank. Um, and then we are still, again, just the resiliency and, and 
you know, our, our resiliency. We have had to be resilient so many times in life that we now believe that we've got the fix and the fix is Horlicks or Bayrum, right? Or a little overproof rum, right? Or going for a big family dinner where you're sitting and it's, the, the rice is piled this high and out of respect for your elders, you're eating through it. But it's sometimes that coping mechanisms for the stress that we're taking on, for the the battles and the fights that we're taking on are unhealthy and contribute more to some of that, you know, not just our, our mental health, but our physical health. So now it's the stress on my back is hurting. Oh my goodness, why is my back hurting? Now there's stress, because now you're worried about your back hurting and now trying to find the time to go and take a look at it with someone who doesn't identify or recognize who you are as a person and may not understand that that speech that you saw from Donald Trump or that um, mispenned, um, grammatically, horribly incorrect op-ed by um, an elected official has that impact on you and you don't know what to do with it. Do you scream? Do you get angry? Do you cry? None of the above because you don't have time. You just got to keep pushing on. So how do we get through that? How do we break that cycle? And how do we continue to be there for each other and and access some of these services? Because now we're getting into, we're achieving. And again, not to, can't downplay what we've achieved as a people, especially over the last, you know, five to 10 years. But it, it, it has a strain, it, you know, it has its toll. Um, and we can't just keep pushing through, right? We've got to cope better and, and work out how we can cope as a people together. If I can just, piggyback on what Stephen said. I love what you said. And Crystal, girl, you you preaching in here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm feeling it. Um, what As you're speaking, Stephen, I just kept thinking it's something that comes up so often is when do we get to come out of survival mode? We function as a status quo in survival mode. And that is not healthy. Our bodies were not designed to be the survival mode is for a season, but we're living like that. And how can we come out when the system won't give us a break? So I, if, if going back to Nicole's question of why discussions like this are so important, that's one of the reasons. We got to figure out a way to not live in survival mode only because we're almost forced into it because of what we face. Um, and I just, I'm sorry, I just had to add that because I, I so appreciate what you said, Stephen. Yeah, I appreciate it. I was just, you know, talking about physical pain and, you know, I've had a rough journey last year with my aunt's out of the blue. She's a worker, worked a lot, um, very powerful, like speaker, you know, always on the go. And I'm going to say came down, but she was diagnosed with cancer with three months, she was gone. And I think that was my stop moment, moment to say, what are we doing to ourselves? Right? Because it's more than just our mental health, it's impacting our bodies, right? And it's passed on. If I talk about like my grandmother who struggled with mental health issues her entire life and nobody knew what those answers were. They they felt that it was like she was crazy or she was unwell and they're blaming her, but not looking at, you know, what is a system that she was part of? What is the trauma that she was holding in her body that she just wasn't, no one was kind of reaching or connecting with? Does anyone have any personal stories or, or experiences that they've witnessed or they've learned or? or hit that bottom for? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll share it. It was, you know, um, this year, last year? Last year. Um, you know, so I, I, I started a, a consulting company because, you know, and I'm sure the panel can attest to this, too many times we're asked our opinion um, and then the information we bring are given to another company and then they create a strategy that doesn't reflect our voice at the table. Um, so I'd started a consulting company with a friend, shout out to PG, um, that allowed us to um, start to become consultants and consult on, on projects um, around community safety and, and community well-being. Um, while doing that, um, I'd taken on the role as a school board trustee, still at the full time, still, at, you know, very active in my in my children's life. Um, and as part of the consulting, um, we got feedback from um, from our contractor, from our vendor, just around a session that didn't go too well. And as they were talking to me, you know, in the back of my mind is like, we cannot mess this up because they will never bring a, 
another black consultant in here to do this kind of work. It would have been their pilot and it failed. And I just felt, how do I fix it? How do I fix it? Meantime, my son was, was at Muay Thai for my full-time work. I had to deliver a presentation and I knew the weekend was coming, which meant a big dirty document like this thick um, was coming to my door and I had to read for it for, um, to prepare for a board meeting. And so I remember standing and, and you know, my, my son came out of uh, Muay Thai and I'm driving and the road is doing this. And I'm like, what's happening? Is it the road? And I'm going up Westney. And if you know the term, you're going east, west and Westney. It's like round. And I, and I was, it looked like I was in a, a cartoon strip the way I was trying to turn the steering wheel. I finally got home and the world was still spinning. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm having a panic attack. And I could not reconcile the fact that I was having a panic attack. At 44 years old, I was having a panic attack and I was pacing around and I didn't know what to do. And it was just a weight on not, of not failing being on me. But I was embarrassed as well, right? I, I didn't want to share it because I felt um, that there would be pity on me, oh my gosh, you know what? We're not gonna ask him to do this. We're not gonna ask him to do this. He's burning out, he needs time. And I was like, I cannot have people feel that I cannot handle this role. I cannot have people feel that this is a weakness. I would love the help and support, but that potentially comes of a cost of people kind of putting me on the sideline. Um, and in the end of burst, I, I, I spoke to my wife. I said, oh my goodness, I've had a panic attack. And then, you know, the conversation from there was just, you got to put it down. You got to put it down. And I, I, to this day, you know, I've said, I will never have another panic attack. And I don't know if that's true. And I'm not even sure how to stop it because I still feel the need to represent the community to the best of my ability because we still have people coming at us who have these racist ideologies and have a platform to spew them. Um, and we've seen what happened with the presidential um, with the president a few years ago and the impact that that had on our society. You know, it's down south, but it, it trickled up here. So, you know, the, the fight is constant, the support is needed and necessary. But I think until you're going through it, you have no idea how scary it is. And, you know, my biggest fear is I put my son's life in danger, right? And that was the thing that was the hardest to reconcile. I'm there driving my son. He's there sitting innocent, just kind of speak about Muay Thai. And I literally could have crashed that vehicle, right? So, yeah, still reconciling that, G. Yeah. Thank you so much for... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Crystal. I was just going to say, thank you so much for sharing that, Stephen, and, and Nicole. And, I, and you know, Nicole, I want to go back to... First of all, I'm so sorry for your loss because my I literally almost started tearing as you were talking. Mm -hmm. um, obviously for your family, but also the number of Black people, Black women, who've just gone through this, who we just don't know about, you know? Um, it's really, it's really, like, I feel it in my heart. And so, um, yeah, I was just thinking about that. For me, so six months ago, it's funny we're having this conversation now. I just, so I, I live alone in my condo and six months ago I had a house fire. And so it was my second day of grad school. Um, I'm still working full time, doing all my stuff, whatever. I was on my way to class and get a call from my neighbors that my house is on fire. And I was like, there's there's no way, whatever. I have a little ki baby kitty. And um, yeah, it was just, so I, I make a U-turn, come back, and the entire building is evacuated. Police, fire everywhere. My condo is completely destroyed. So for the last six months, up until this Friday, actually, I just moved back into my home this Friday. I was temporarily displaced, fortunately. Um, I was just moved to a model suite in my condo building. And so I was still in my building, just somewhere else. But in that time, I'm running my business, I'm running my private practice, I'm in school, I'm doing my stuff, I'm doing all the things. And so there's still this demand to perform excellence, you know? Um, and I did, I definitely succumbed to that. Now, I will say in the last couple of years, I've been very intentional about my mental health, my holistic well being. Um, and a huge part of that has been what parts of myself do I need to say yes to and what parts of my world do I need to say no to in order to do that. And so I think I did do that intentionally. But another thing that, um, and you know, Stephen, when you say like, I'm still processing and reconciling it, I'm still processing and reconciling it, you know? Um, 
there obviously you know went to therapy did all this stuff i'm a huge workout fanatic and so i'm always in the gym love all that stuff um and so i think on the outside it looks like i'm taking really good care of myself i'm doing all the things that i need to be doing i'm leaning into my emotions i'm all of those things and it wasn't until maybe two months ago one of my girlfriends she's a doctor but she's also my personal trainer um we were in a session and we had to do my measurements and so we were doing my measurements and um, there was a part of my body, I can't remember which part it was, but um, where there was a lot of weight. And she was like, that's so disproportionate to the other areas of your body. And so she, we were at her clinic too, so she was going through everything and she said, that's the part of your body that holds the most trauma. And so in the middle of this session, I break down and just start crying. <laughs> and so I was like, and I think that's the first time I cried in a really long time. And I, I, I was like, I feel like my body just told on me that you're not okay. That like, yes, you've been doing all the stuff. You've been getting great grades. You've been thriving on all your things, but you're not okay. You've been going to therapy and you're not okay, you know? And so I think like the, the, the personal reality and just revelation that my body, when my body had been speaking to me, I'd been having moments where I was like, mm, this doesn't feel right or oh, whatever, but I'm, I'm performing well and everyone sees it and I see it and I feel good. So I'm just going to ignore that part of myself. And so even the way that we ignore some of the cues, you know what I mean? And literally can be doing all of the right things and still, and you know, see me talked about it. We have sometimes healthy coping mechanisms, spending time with family and doing all of those things, but are our coping mechanisms all okay? There was a time in my life, I used, I went to the gym so much, I got two injuries and my, and my therapist was like, why are you going to the gym so much? <laughs> and it was an escape, you know? And so we need to ask ourselves, when are these out, when are these coping mechanisms escapes versus outlets and so i had to take a step back and realize there were parts of this journey i hadn't fully leaned into um, that were showing up in my bodies in ways that weren't that apparent going to doctor's visits getting great results everything you know what i mean and so what are some of those invisible cues sometimes when it comes to mental health that we don't pay attention to but it's like is it's screaming at us wow thank you that's a lot to carry over the last six months. That's a lot. I appreciate you sharing. Everything is okay now, by the way, everyone. It's, <laughs> look at you trying to fix it. Like, it's okay. We'll sit in the fact that, whoa, like, <laughs> wow. Is your kitty okay? Yeah, actually, just a quick story to highlight this mess of a situation. When um, my kitty, she was out, the, or I was on, my neighbor called me crying, and I was like, what's wrong? She's like, never mind, never mind. And when I came, the fire inspector was crying. And so I was like, what's wrong? And he's like, every time we came out without your cat, all your neighbors were like, you need to go get that cat, or we're gonna barricade the doors, because all my neighbors know how much I love my cat. <laughs> And so if this is what this is what community building is. And so my fire, the fire guy told me, he's like, they literally would not let him come out without the cat. Like when he came out, he was crying. So I was like, oh, so there was a, that was just a beautiful part. So yes, she's actually beside me right now sleeping. <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, so my kitty's okay. Um, shout out to your neighbors. And uh, another, this is the kind of knowledge that we need to know that trauma that is trapped in the body, um, also sharing it is really about defining what self-care looks like for you. Thanks for sharing. Uh, another question, why is it so hard to see someone suffer mentally and not know how to help? It feels like I have to get my own degree to help them because there's nowhere else to turn to. So I'll leave can the I, question. Can I speak to that? Yeah, I was going to leave it to you. Go ahead. Yeah, one of the things that I find is people often shy away from not being of help. And we, we think we have to have degrees to be helpful, but we are negating the benefit of mere presence. A lot of times when people are struggling, they're not always looking to talk about it because they're well aware of what's not working. They don't necessarily want to focus on it 24 seven. Sometimes they just want somebody to be in their presence and give them the option to just be. Um, I can use a personal example. I lost my sister in 2009 and one of my colleagues called me and she's like, let's go see this movie. And I was like, I was so grateful because I was like, I wanted a chance to be Natasha, not Natasha who had lost her sister for a few minutes because most people, and I appreciated people reaching out with their concern, but I also didn't want to focus on it all the time. And that really, I don't even know if she knew how much that did for me by giving me a chance to get out the house, 
go see a lighthearted, silly movie. And, but just being some, one of my love languages is, is um, quality time. So for me, being in people's presence is healing. And for many people, it's whether that's their love language or not, being in people's presence. So I would say for somebody who's wondering, they don't know what to say, they don't know, they feel like they, they don't have the right words, they don't have enough education, don't negate the power of your presence. Um, offer that and you and also asking the question of you know how can I support you and being honest about if you're capable of doing it because a lot of times when you ask people that they're like I, I just need you here I'm just grateful you're here and they'll let you know that that's how you're being of help to them so um, while it's also good to learn ways to be able to offer words of support again my what I said don't negate the power of your presence I agree. Just being able to be present, to listen, to talk, to laugh. It's huge. Um, we have lots of time. We're going to like 830. And all this talk about racial trauma in the body, I really, really want to share this video with all of you. Um, I've shared it in lots of my talks. So for those who have seen me talk before, I apologize if this is a repeat. But I thought um, it really breaks down a really great way of understanding how trauma shows up in our bodies in ways that we've been talking about today. So, yeah. White comfort trumps black. I gotta get myself off. Can you guys hear it? Freedom. White comfort trumps black joy. White comfort trumps. If that is not addressed, it will slide in and be behind the scenes and you won't even know it's there. America has seen black trauma play out for years. If you want to survive, do and say as little as possible. Through movies about slavery and racial terror in all its forms. And even more viscerally in real life, with every case of police harassment and violence against black people. After George Floyd's murder at the hands of police, the country finally started waking up to systemic racism and the silent trauma it inflicts. There's growing research into racism's real impact on the body, especially how stress can impact health and how your DNA works. Resma Menikam, a therapist and trauma specialist, has been drawing on this research for years. In the months following Floyd's death, his 2017 book about racialized trauma made it to the New York Times bestseller list. We checked in with him in May. So you're a therapist and racial trauma expert, if you could define what racial trauma is. Yeah. So for me, racial trauma is number one, um, the idea that the white body is the supreme standard of humanness. Me and you were born into a structure by which the white body deemed it, it deems itself and deemed itself the human standard, right? And, 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 and we were considered to be the deviants from that hum, human standard. And so the trauma element um, is that uh, it is unceasing, it is pervasive, it is persistent, right? And it is woven in and around and through every institution, along with something not reparative. So it's not just that something bad happened to you, it's that something bad happened to you and there was no, um, there was no reprieve. You talk about in your book that white supremacy literally not just figuratively lives in our blood our dna expression our nervous system absolutely can you break absolutely. down what that actually means yeah i come from a people that were brutalized raped could not run could not flee terrorized their towns burned up uh girls uh, blown up in the church right all of that stuff for 250 years was happening to me or to my people. When, when somebody is brutalized, there are particular things that happen to the nervous system. One of them is that there is a release of adrenaline. 
There's a release of cortisol. There's a release of uh, norepinephrine. And those things are designed to get you out of danger or help you fight or flee out of danger. And, 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 and those things are only supposed to be in your nervous system for short bursts of time. But what if the thing that is that is dangerous doesn't leave for 250 years? What happens to all of that adrenaline? What happens to all of that cortisol? What does it do to the DNA expression? One of the things about DNA expression is it's designed to turn things on and off on the DNA. There is a certain kind of thing that makes that DNA say, be hypervigilant. What, you know, look for things, you know, uh, the, the, this place is dangerous. Don't look white people in the eyes, but it's unspoken. We have it, we have it in our bodies as notions. So imagine that going down just from one line all the way down. And by the time it gets to me and you, we have this sense that something is off. We have this vibratory sense and we don't, we don't have a language for it. Time decontextualizes trauma, right? So trauma in a person looks like personality, can look like personality over time. Trauma in a family can look like family traits over time. Trauma in a people can look like culture over time. You know, what are some examples Absolutely. of culture? So my grandmother used to have a, a braided switch, right? that was braided and put behind uh, her her and my grandfather's picture. And every time you look up, you see that switch, right? If we got out of line, right? My grandmother would would, uh, would whoop us, right? You know, get your butt back in line, whoop us. Well, think about 250 years of whippings, of rearing of, of brutality on the black body. I believe that whoopings is a traumatic retention from whippings. These are the things that we have to examine, right? And, and the same thing happens for white folks, right? White folks have never examined the thousand years of brutality that they experienced at the hands of other white folks through the Middle Ages, through through a thousand years of that, that Euro violence. And then that body came here, <laughs> right? Without any reprieve, without anything. And so by the time elite white bodies offered poor white bodies whiteness, they, by the time they were offered the idea of not being servants, not being, um, and, and they were still were, but, but, but there was another level that was put in there and that level was above uh, Africans. By the time they were offered it, they took it because they understood what the brutality was like at the hands of elite white bodies. They don't have a collective way of getting at that violence. You talk about how, that there's a perception that whiteness is working out for white people, but yeah. it isn't. Can you explain that? Yeah. Um, the reason why I say it's not working out for white people is that it, the, for white people to participate in the structure like this means that they must, uh, give up part of their humanity to, 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 to participate. They get advantages, right? Uh, economic advantages, advantages, split second advantages. They know that if they move against the structure as it currently exists, that they will lose things. They understand that they will lose relationships. They will lose access. They will lose um, things that uh, that have to be given up in order to destroy and dismantle um, this the, the system, the white body supremacist system as it currently exists. White bodies have to begin to do the work among other white bodies to reclaim their humanity, right? Um, to begin to look at this as a structural issue. When we look at how you connect white supremacy and neuroscience, um, I think yeah. it'd be really helpful to just kind of hear you talk through what the yeah. soul nerve is, as you call it. There is a, um, a, a nerve that comes out of the brainstem and it hits in the pharynx, pieces of it hit in the face, it hits in the chest, it hits in the belly, it goes on, it's, it's called the vagal nerve or the vagus nerve. The vagal nerve is responsible for helping you notice environmental vibrations, what, what's potentially dangerous, right? And so this is why we have uh, things like gut reactions to something. You meet somebody and you go, I don't quite know about that person, but something's telling me, ah, 
right? You don't really have the words to describe what it is, but you know you're picking up on something. How does it explain police interactions? There's this idea, um, one idea out here called triune brain. And the triune brain is the neocortex, the mammalian part of the brain, and then the lizard brain. The lizard brain is actually one of the oldest parts of the brain that was mo mostly tied to our survival. Fight, flight, freeze, fawn, those types of things. When an officer comes upon a black body, there are these things that light up in the lizard brain that are about fight, flight, freeze, fawn. One of the things that can happen is that the vagal nerve can constrict and protect and people will feel a visual experience of bracing. And then they come out of a society that, that in which they have been conditioned to see the black body as impervious to pain, right? The black body that must be subdued with extraordinary amount of force because their bodies are different and they are different and they are, and they will destroy you if you don't um, take uh, uh, um, um, some type of lethal uh, stance. And, and many times that bracing goes unexamined throughout the course of people's lives, but it also goes unexamined throughout the course of, of police officers being trained. And so you've consulted with police departments. What kind of reaction yeah, do you get when I, you talk to them about white body supremacy? They don't really like it because because they, they think that is you know, all they have to do is tweak around the edges, right? They don't believe that there's this that this is a this is structural, not episodic. There is a commitment that many police departments don't want to make, right? And and that is that a lifetime commitment towards uprooting white body supremacy, right? Uh, a lifetime commitment towards helping police officers understand their own bodies and how they have been conditioned by a structure that, that and by which the white body has deemed itself the supreme standard, regardless of what color those police officers are. As far as healing work, where does one even begin? How can a black person start to heal racial trauma? Right. One of the first things that we have to do is we have to acknowledge that something has happened and continues to happen to us, right? And it's not a figment of, a, of our imagination. One of the things I say to black bodies all the time is, you are not defective. You're not defective. The system and the structure would have you believe that you're fraudulent and you're an imposter and because you don't quite measure up to the white body standard, right? In a myriad of different ways. And so healing really does involve reclaiming pieces that uh, that were um, put aside in order to survive what it is that we're dealing with right now. And so I just wanted to know what, 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 sorry, what came up for everyone? So, I know, it was almost done, it's getting there. We can cover the rest. What came up for you? I feel like it's everything that we just talked about. One of the things that came up for me when he talked about, uh, you know, again, what Crystal's touched on, how our bodies are carrying generationally I often, and I'll do it now, I often show people my water bottle and I'll say, you know, we're thinking now, usually I hopefully have more water to demonstrate this, but if you think about water, like the water bottle, like your body and the water as a stress in your body, we sometimes think this is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but we forget we've started with a certain amount based on generational stuff. And then things happen by the time we're five, 10, 15. So no wonder we're almost always up here. And so even when Stephen talked about having a panic attack, I remember having one too. And I had it on a day I was in a good mood, but I think it was my body's just like, no, I'm carrying too much. I need to let some of this out. And when we're not necessarily aware because it's insidious, we live daily with some of these things. We don't necessarily know how much is being poured in. So I often talk to people about mental health and self-care about what are we doing to pour it back out? What are our intentional ways to release and being aware of the fact that our bodies are holding. So when he talked about what our bodies are holding, that came up, that was really important for me, I think, to have people understand we can't disconnect mind and body to our connected and where our healing comes from understanding ourselves as multi-dimensional beings. And so how are we addressing what we're holding in the body as part of how we're addressing our mental health? Yeah, that, oh. 
Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just... I, no, I, I love that. And I, I think, again, going back to even, again, our opening and just thinking about how we connect to land. Like, these are Indigenous ways of knowing this understanding of our mind-body connection, but also our understanding to how our mind and body is connected to our relationship with the world around us. Whether the, we're talking about systems, we're talking about the physical land. Like, it's 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 not it's natural to experience particular things, but also dysfunction be, can, be, can become naturalized. And so, like, thinking about how, you know, leaning into some of these community-centric forms of care and also understanding of our bodies and, and our mental health is such a transformative way to heal. I think something that came up for me while I was watching it was when he talked about police officers being unresponsive because they think that white supremacy is systemic and not um, episodic, I believe he said it was. And it reminds me of what you said earlier, in Nicole Baum, like white people have been affected by colonization and white supremacy too. Carrying that kind of power and the sense of dehumanization for another person is in and of itself like psychologically and chronically problematic, you know, and it's going to cost What happened? Me too. I think her system's frozen. <laughs> it's like, no. Oh my God. The energy was too much for Bella and Rogers to, <laughs> to handle. So they're like, shut this down. <laughs> He's speaking too much truth. Oh, geez. <laughs> So I had a piece, I mean, not to, because I think Krista was like getting to something that, that we, we feel and we see and, and again, we can't reconcile, right? Because it, it's it's so wrong that you ask the question, like, how could you continue to act this way? But there are officers that continue to act this way. And I think the reality for us is although we see many US and American references, we have the Canadian context yeah. to this. So it's not, you know, it, it, it's that one step closer to us. So the, there's that fear. And, you know, as he was, um, you know, as he was speaking, I'd written down that it feels like when we blow up or, or have that, that moment, it's not that actual trauma, that incident that we're responding to. We're actually responding to smaller unmanaged incidents of smaller trauma right so you know just quick story um sons i mean some challenges with school just um with, with fitting in um and then i don't know why but they sent a note home um they sent an email saying oh you know just so you know and a little kid came a, a kid came up to your son and punched him in the back um and i lost it i i'm like i went i pulled him out of school um my daughter was home from 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 university so i'm like take care of take care of your brother i need to go and find this person's parents and i need to have a word with them and as i'm like driving to try and find them not really knowing where they live i realized it wasn't that incident that upset me it was the many times where i hadn't stood up for myself or those you know i'd been hit and punched not physically but like mentally and i just took it and you know, that was that moment where I'm just like, you're not going to hurt him the way that you've hurt me. So I projected what he was feeling, but it was really what I was feeling. And the fight was not for him, but just the hurt that it had caused me, you know, over the years. Um, and it is, I think someone put in the chat, like, how do you, you know, where do you place that trauma, right? But how do you rid yourself of that positively, which I think is, is the un... You know, there's mechanisms and, and supports and there's um, opportunities, but we don't always access them, so. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing. I would even add like your ancestors as well, right? Like all of that trauma gets carried through and it's, it's no longer about your son being hit in the back, which yes, that would get me really angry, but it's about all of the incidences of violence that Black people experience on a daily, daily level. Thank you so much for the comments. It's much appreciated. Crystal, we we were like, you were too powerful for the bandwidth and <laughs> we need you back. So if you can remember in the moment of what you were saying. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, everyone. I don't know. Yeah, okay. like the, okay. right now. <laughs> 
Um, I think I was just wrapping up to say that, yeah, I think that white people are impacted by colonialism and white supremacy too in a very violent way. And we, because we oftentimes use privilege as a way to um, masquerade the deteriorating impacts of white supremacy, I think we sometimes say they're not, they're not negatively affected by this. We're all affected by it. And so I think like the video just like really drives home for me, like that again, this is, this impacts us all in negative ways and our freedom is interconnected. You know, if black people cannot be free and indigenous people cannot be free, white people cannot be free, you know? And so I think when we think about things in that kind of, that kind of way, and we think about that interconnectedness, it's so powerful. And the last thing I want to mention is, I was going to reference this later, but I'll, I'll do it now because I think it's relevant. Viral Justice is a book by Ro Benjamin. She is a um, UCLA, oh no, that, that's Kimberly Crenshaw. She is a Princeton um, professor, but also black socio sociologist. And Viral Justice was written right out of COVID. Um, and it was a way to kind of conceptualize how COVID-19 as a pandemic really exemplified for us the power of um, virality and how something so minuscule and invisible can be contagious, you know, and she didn't undermine like the impacts of COVID-19, but how it exasperated, as, as, as we know, it exasperated a lot of pre-existent health issues in people's body. It also exasperated some pre-existent health issues for our society. You know what I mean? And just when we see the, the, the racial uproar that came after the public execution of George Floyd, you know, that was still obviously that happened during COVID and that's not the first time we've seen that, but there was something about the COVID-19 COVID that pandemic that placed a demand on our sense of collective energy and our sense of collective resistance. But in the book, she talks about so many historical, but also contemporary examples of how anti-Black racism has manifested in the Medicare system, in the in the penal system and all of these different structures but she also invites us into the possibility that the same way COVID-19 could be contagious just by small interactions and so can white supremacy, so can change. And she's not doing it to romanticize, oh, it's the little things that make a big difference. She very much recognizes and then doesn't take for granted the very real systemic beast that we're dealing with, but she acknowledges there are some things that white supremacy has has convinced us of and that uh, one, of, one of those things is how interconnectedness and how relational um, healing can actually heal our bodies. And so, and the, the power of being seen and like Natasha was talking about earlier, like presence and just someone sitting with you and holding space for you. And so I just, I invite everyone into that book and that read to just reimagine and think about how we can, how we can do this outside of some of these systems. Thank you, Crystal. Um, I'm not going to talk about like what happened last week, but I do want to talk about Stephen. What was the impact of having community members come together to advocate for change? Like what was what was that like? Can you reflect on it and reflect on the experience? It, it, it was it was powerful and it was powerful. It was I can't remember where it happened, but I still see the picture. It was like that Canadian version of that that riverboat incident where you had people jumping in to the um into the water and running across and then you know there was sort of culturally violence enacted but it was a moment of saying we're not going to take it anymore but collectively um and you know it was powerful because this wasn't the first time the black community was supposed to go um to council chambers to address um you know, an act by this elected official. Um, but the first time it happened, it was just one black woman hmm. who went and tried to take on, and she, you know, that um, elected official, I brought her supporters. But this time we turned it around and, you know, there was um, one of the, um, you know, one of the delegates said, I was going to leave it alone. But this time I said, I couldn't. And that's why I'm here. And the, the accounts were powerful and it was our story. And regardless of what she did after, we told our story in a very powerful and, and meaningful way. And we all stood behind each other. And I think, you know, just reflecting on the power of us when we come together, the power of us when you hurt one, you hurt all. And the ability to represent who we are and, and the importance um, of Black History Month and celebrating not where we've been but where, where we are and where we're going um, and even just to see people I've looked up to for years say that and get emotional was just 
powerful beyond belief and just kind of I'm motivated to, to keep going. I got two more years of this trustee stuff and I was just like, oh, oh, we're going to hit you with everything. <laughs> like we're, we're coming out of this. And I'm listening, you know, I, I, Natasha, we're going to have to connect because I've heard some stuff about school boards and, and, and um, what our students are still going through. And we have an ability to make a change. We have the votes on our side to make a change. We have the platforms to make a change. I, you know, a part of it I didn't know is you set the agenda. You can set the agenda for any of the meetings. So if the conversation is, we are still underserving our, our students, then let us put that on the agenda. And then listen to the next board meeting because that is your voice in that room. So just, it was inspiring just to continue down this path and allow us to be heard of who we are and what we're feeling today. Thank you for sharing. It was, yeah, it was very powerful just from the youngest person to, you know, the elder in the room, like it was, it was powerful. So I appreciate the work of the community of bringing us and solidifying us together. Um, we have more conversations this week. So I'm taking like a little interim break, but we have some more conversations this week. On Wednesday, we're going to have a conversation with Melissa Taylor. We should talk about somatic healing, you know, lots of what we've been sharing today. On Thursday evening at seven, we're gonna have another conversation on black men's mental health. Um, with some phenomenal speakers, again, you know, speaking about the importance of black men and their health and also of black boys too, as they get older and the intersections of that identity as well. We have a very diverse um, audience. And then on Friday, I'm speaking at noon on the topic of grief and loss and talking about how we as a people move through grief and loss and what does that look like as a community. Um, my friend Nadise is gonna put the Eventbrite link for everyone to see, but also Eventbrite like only allows us to have 25 free spots, but we're open. So if you need a ticket, if you need the Zoom link, please reach out to us at info at pajangafamily.org. And she'll put that in the chat too. <sighs> So there was questions around, you know, community resources, but I we have talked a lot today about just like intergenerational experiences. And so wanting to kind of put it out to anyone, you know, to talk about why is it important for us to talk about the past? Why is it important for us to bring up the intergenerational experience? Can we kind of land our conversation to, as almost like an action? for um, people today in terms of how do we do that? Oh, I, I thought Stephen was gonna go. <laughs> um, I think oh, this could be a whole nother panel discussion, but I think the, the idea of intergenerational um, Heal it. And I think we've definitely touched on it in terms of the somatic pieces is that this trauma didn't just exist in my body. Like it is like trauma literally changed our DNA and therefore everything birth, everyone birth after these kind of experiences inherited some of those those pieces. Um, and again, I think in the current Medicare system, you know, there it's over there's overwhelming statistics and research to demonstrate how black bodies, particularly black female bodies, are experiencing harm at the hands of these systems. But it's important to know that that, that didn't just start in the contemporary forms of Medicare that we see. Um, and I think that, you know, there's this quote that I love and it says, there's a couple variations of it, but if generation, if trauma can be passed down through generations, then so can healing. And, you know, I know it's very popular, these ideas of breaking generational curses and breaking generational cycles, but in order to do that, we have to do it at the root, right? And so we have to know where what, where did hyper-independence in Black women come from? Where did this hyper-masculine masculinity come from in Black men that were unable to be vulnerable with one another? You know, um, I remember, I'll never forget when I was in high school, I, with a, a friend and colleague, we were selected by our schools when DSB did And So We Rise um, to be a part of that planning committee. And so we hosted a workshop called Hashtag Black Youth Are You Listening? And at the time it was designed to really think about the relationships amongst black men and women. And I remember now having the language and, and ideas and frame of mind to put words to it at the time, I would have just described it as it was a very emotional session. It was a very intense atmosphere. And I think it's because it was the first time we created a space 
to talk about what's been going on in our communities and our generations relationally, you know what I mean? And as much as there was lots of tears and there was some, you know, tension and so forth, I could also see some breakthrough, you know what I mean? And some space where I didn't realize that's where that was coming from. And so now that I'm aware of that, I can begin a trajectory of healing. So I think that it's important to talk about intergenerational trauma and understand it because when we can go back to the genealogy, like Robert Maynard says this in her book, Police and Black Lives, a history that goes unacknowledged is doomed to be repeated. If we can acknowledge it and we can name it and we can provide frameworks to conceptualize it, then we have a, a better framework to use to address it politically, um, interpersonally and personally for ourselves. Absolutely. Thank you. So I think for me and, and Nicole, you, you've actually touched on it is, you know, as, as a people, we, we value the, the fight and the struggle that our, that our grandparents went through. Um, and, you know, as we've seen this world change and, you know, through social media and now the, the, the stories and the history is, is in our face. You, 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 it's a real, right? It's it's a story, it's a, a Facebook, it's a meme. And there's that understanding like, so my grandfather was part of the Windrush generation um, that migrated from um, Jamaica to England. Um, and there is um, a documentary about it. But for his, I, I wanna say it's his 90th birthday, we actually found the document that he was given prior to boarding the boat that basically said, um, don't talk to white women. It's going to be frowned upon. You cannot live in, in this area um, because that is not, you know, that is not your area. You probably won't get a high paying job, but that's OK. And still he got on the boat and still tried to push to make, um, you know, a better life for um, our family and you know understanding that understanding that struggle and then to hear that the British government were then deported that generation you know hurt right it, it, and it I felt it I felt it in my core it's like you you hear these the, these stories of systemic racism but to now feel it and live it so close to home and then see it repeated in the actions of some who are in power just you know it, it touches like your heart and there's that push and again for us to be excellent to reverse it so it never happens again so what the next generation don't doesn't go through it so um i think it's more than about just knowing that it exists it's feeling and, and being closely and, and more closely connected to those stories and, and the will to make it never happen again I so appreciate what you both have said. And I'm sitting there going, what can I add? I think the only thing that I can add is when we look down in the generations, it gives us context and understanding of some of the things, especially the way it was described in the video about how it's passed down in our DNA. Now, Crystal said it changes our DNA, but I also want to look back to see what in my DNA is why I can persevere, why who I am that had, what in my lineage gives me the strength the ability to continue. And, you know, one of the things I've struggled with is how disconnected I am from my history. When I want to look up, I have a Scottish last name. When I want to look up my coat of arms, all I'm finding out is what's happening in the UK. And I'm like, that doesn't tell me anything. And my, I asked my dad and he's like, I know two brothers moved from Africa and my dad's from St. Kitts. One settled St. Kitts, one settled Nevis. Five generations passed. That's all he knows. He doesn't know what part of Africa, he doesn't know what country. And I'm like, I wish we had more. And I would love to be able to get that part as part of the healing too, is to know who we are, not just to see how we were harmed, but to see the amazing things about who we are as people, to get those specifics, to understand um, what is in my DNA that, that really makes us great. Um. Thank you so much for sharing. I think two years ago, I was all into this DNA world. I'm gonna drop a chat because I think, as you said, it's important, right? To understand our roots. And 
through looking at DNA pieces, I'm learning information about my family that I had no idea existed, right? And so if you're okay with sending your DNA off to, you know, African ancestry, it might show you some something amazing in your history. So, and I agree, I, I see there's so much resilience within us, right? And I reflect upon my ancestors who may have been shipped here um, to North America and I'm like, I don't know how they did it because I would have just said, okay, bye, right? And that to me is, is resilience in itself. Um, the resilience I talked earlier about my grandmother who you know, had survived um, some really horrific mental health treatments and electric shock treatments and all the stuff that she, was, that she had gone through. But this woman made me laugh and she could cook and she tells like really nice stories. And so there's, that resilience and peace that's part of, you know, who I am as a person. Um, and I often say, like, when Stephen was talking, I was like, if you could, if your family could see you now, right? And just that excellence that we bring to the table all the time. I guess this is the time of the conversation. We talk about what community resources, what are some strategies, what are some suggestions that you have that maybe can support someone who is contemplating or considering addressing their mental health? Um, what are some symptoms that, you know, would you consider as um, in need of intervention? What are your thoughts? And I, I think I can go around the room for that um, as well. Maybe starting with, who's, who talked last? Crystal, maybe starting with Crystal. Um, what are your suggestions and strategies? Um, so the first one is definitely locating community. Um, and I, I think just like a very simple, where are the relationships that feel like home? Where are the relationships where you feel seen, where you feel like you can be unfiltered and undone? And even if it's not entirely, just again, the spaces that make you like, uh, that, that neutralize your nervous system in a healthy way, like pay attention to those things um, and, and, and strengthen those, co those coalitions. Because again, like if I think about even the last six months of my life, I have a lot of practical resources because of my work and all of that stuff. But if I think about the things that really saved me, it was relationships. It was people who wouldn't let me be by myself. It was like my mother, it was my grandmother. It was those kind of untangible, like the system didn't give me that. Um, and so, um, and I also recognize that again, thinking about ancestry, a lot of us may have feeling strange from community for different reasons, but there's like, you know, um, Women of Color Collective Durham, who is, which is designed to connect racialized women, um, black women and so forth within Durham region. Um, and also like if, if Iferata and Kujenga is phenomenal. Like I, I remember the first time I saw the, the opportunity to join the advisory, I was like, what? someone's doing black health work in Durham and joined immediately without even fully reading everything. And, it, and just Nicole, you and your team have taken this to such an incredible place. And I know this is a labor of love that has built this organization. And, but I also know there are so many events that are as much as they're about mental health and community and child welfare and all those pieces, they're also just about building capacity for us to connect and so um there's Iferata there's also um oh my gosh it's escaping my head right now but oh my gosh I had like a list of resources um it's in my head but sim in terms of symptoms um I you know I know we probably see this in Instagram memes all the time but one of the things that's really 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 been transformative is pay paying attention to my body like I mentioned you know where are the places when I how do I feel when I leave a place how, where do I feel safe? Where do I feel excited? Where do I feel happy? When does my body tense up? When does it get nervous? What kind of conversations make me feel unsafe and so forth? And document those things. I started doing that a year ago. And even though, again, like I mentioned in my story that after the fire, there was some challenges around that. I will say in the things that I was implementing, listening to my body, paying attention and actively responding. When my body says, no, Crystal, you don't want to go out tonight, even though you said you would, just change your plans that's okay and and that's been transformative when it's when it, my body said um you know yes you want you want to go to the gym or this that whatever this is a good time to do it it was transformative and so i think leaning into some of those cues somatic therapies becoming very very popular and i think a lot of it has to do with the fact that there have been so much reports of ailments since covid but that just the mind body soul connection um so yeah th those are some resources and ideas that come to mind and i will stop there i feel like there's more if i think of any i will say them before we end here thank you crystal um somatic therapies i have this author i'm going to look for his name and i'll put it in the chat 
but I've been trying EMDR. I don't know if anyone's heard of that here on the panel, but it's uh, another somatic way of healing through that as well as neurofeedback as well. So um, oh, if anyone I else has any other somatic, you have a somatic one? Yes. Yes, it's not, it's not just somatic, but it's really good. Um, Dr. Anita Phillips, uh, The Guardian Within. Everyone needs to read that book. <laughs> the Guardian yes. Within, so Dr. Phillips is a, as a psychotherapist. But, and we didn't discuss this, but now it's, it's coming to mind, the intersection between spirituality and mental health, Absolutely. you know? Who are like me and born and raised Christian and told to pray away these demons. <laughs> it's like, it's so powerful, but she profoundly in, like addresses the intersections of spirituality and mental health. And if you were born and raised, she took, particularly talks about her experiences in a Christian home, some of the implications and yes, like our parents were doing what they could with the best that they could, but that has left some generational impacts and given people complex relationships. But she talks about, she names about seven different therapeutic modalities. EMDR is one of them. Um, and she breaks down what all of them do and she lists resources as to how you can access them, but she's phenomenal. So yeah, read that. I'll find, I'll try to find the link and put it in the chat. Thank you, Crystal. Natasha. Um, so uh, I would say for Durham, Kajenga, obviously, um, Durham Family Cultural Center. I always get it wrong, which is bad because I've been doing work with them. They just had their fifth year anniversary. They're fairly new, but they are doing a lot of great work within the community. Um, one thing I tell people is don't forget to Google and be specific in your Google search. Um, a lot of people tell me they find me because they put black therapists, black female therapists in this area, right? If you're looking for therapy, if you have coverage from your benefits, um, check out Psychology Today. You can add, you can zone it down, but there's also blacktherapistlist.com where it's specifically all black therapists. So if you want, you know that you're looking for therapy. Um, a lot of people think that therapy is because they have a mental illness. I would encourage you to think about how we use vitamins versus medicine. We do vitamins to keep up our levels so that we don't get to the point of being ill. Therapy can be that. It can help you maintain so you don't slip into the point where you end up with a mental health illness. Or if you do have something that you already know is diagnosed or not diagnosed and you need a therapist as well, then be open to therapy. A lot more people are, are, are bridging those gaps because it wasn't necessarily something that was um, welcomed in our community, but we cannot do it all on our own. We are, are not meant to exist as an island. And so if you can seek support, check out what local agencies exist, um, get on their websites because I mean, I don't know if you'd be so bold if you got an agency that was more widespread and just asked if they had black staff, but I'm like, it never hurts to do that and find out if you're looking to get connected somewhere, especially if you don't necessarily have the funds for a paid service. Um, looking at what the options are within a bigger organization like CMHA or something like that and see are there ways to get, get connected to people. But um, I would encourage people to, one, as, as Crystal said, tap into your community and your community is your friends, your family, your churches, your faith-based organizations, um, just everywhere that you build community, lean into the love that you have in your life. And then beyond that, look at what other ways there are to get support. Ask people questions. If you see people who are struggling and doing better, ask them how they, what, what they, what avenue pursued, and they might be able to give you some great feedback on some other options. That's very powerful. Can we normalize that? Asking who are your black staff? You know, what kind of training do you do in equity? Um, when you're connecting with those organizations and you can shop around for therapists. I've had multiple, I think over six therapists that I've seen. So it's okay to meet other people because maybe you might not jive with that person, right? Um, it's not a one fit all. You have to find the person that fits with you. And yeah, can I just add to that for yeah, anybody shopping please. for, they're looking for a therapist, find out if they offer a free consult. I know I do because I tell people, I jokingly say, I think I'm wonderful, but I'm not the right fit for everybody. Exactly. And so get on a Zoom with them, meet them in person 10 to 15, 20 minutes and get a little bit of a feel for what they're like as a person before you commit and then feel like, oh no, because sometimes people think therapy is ineffective and what's really the disconnect is actually in the relationship between the therapist and the client. So yeah, definitely see if you can get a free consult to start. Can you say that again? I feel like you need to say that again. Oh, just to, to request a free consultation the when you're looking for a therapist. Yeah, because there's often a disconnect between therapist and client where, you know, we're not designed to get along with absolutely everybody. 
And the whole point of being in therapy is you have to feel safe within that relationship. So if there's a disconnect in the relationship, how are you going to feel safe enough to really bring all the issues that you're facing and get the full benefit of therapy? Yeah, 100%. Thank you. Stephen, what are your thoughts? Um, I think the, the one point that just kept coming up as um, Natasha and Crystal were speaking was don't ignore your check engine light, right? So um, you, you, our, our bodies are, again, great and resilient. And, you know, it's whenever I go on vacation with my son or we go to England, I'm astonished that he'll go to the washroom at the beginning of the flight and at the end. And I'm up and down going to the washroom every time. It means something's not right, right? That headache that you didn't have every two seconds when you were, you know, five years ago and now you have headache, something's not right. So don't ignore your your, your body's check engine light. Um, use the resources, get a doctor. And, you know, I will speak volumes to finding a doctor that I could build a history with um, and, and has my records and, and you know, it's like, well, you've done your blood work a couple of times and, you know, your cholesterol was here and now it's here. Something's not right. Um, and, and giving yourself the time to go get it checked out. Um, it was funny because about one of my last appointments with him, it's like, you need to decrease your intake of bad news. And that's the only medicine I can give you. And, you know, that bad news was social media. Every two seconds, I'm watching those, those reels and the disasters. It's like, you know what's going to happen, but I'll stay there to the fifth minute and 58 second to watch that disaster happen. And then I'll go to the next reel and I'll do the same and I'll continue to do the same. And then it's the algorithms that are continuously pumping that bad news into your life and onto your screen. So how do you disconnect? Because subsequently, then you get the headache or then you wake up fatigued and tired. It's because your body overnight cannot process the amount of trauma that it's just witnessed. And sometimes that, that trauma is likened to something you go through. You see car crash every day, but then you're about to jump in a car and then drive down the highway, the stress that is manifested through there. So use the professionals and, and hold these agencies and organizations accountable. Don't normalize nonsense, right? So to your point, there should be representation. We've spoken time and time again on how um, our experience is important and having someone who's likened to our ex experience is important. So if there are our tax dollars and your tax dollars going into a healthcare system and you don't see yourself represented or you're not comfortable with going to that healthcare system or healthcare provider, then call them on it. Our children don't have to go to school and, and shouldn't feel fear every time they go to school. There are answers and there are supports, but we can't normalize it. It's not just another day in school. So start to call these organizations, look up what they said that they're going to do um, and make sure that they're doing it. There are a lot of resources. There are, there are a ton of resources. Um, and I think unfortunately, um, we get to a point where we're just like, I give up, nothing's going to change. Um, but that's the mentality that allows some of these agencies to, to not change. Right. The last thing I say is we have brilliant ideas um, and we need to start kind of hoarding those ideas that I, I don't want someone to take this and make a million dollars off it. Bring it forward. Have these conversations. I constantly, every time I have a good idea, I, I WhatsApp Nicole. I'm like, we need this program. How do we get this going? Because I've A, already exists or B, could enhance another program that meets the needs. We are in an, an age that is changing so quickly. Our young people or young people aren't necessarily selling drugs, but now some of our young people are being talked into steel vehicles, right? So how do we change? How do we adapt with them? It's by having these conversations. The last thing I'll say is you have no idea how powerful your network is until you access them. And it's because some of those experiences that we've gone through and with how close, they've done the same. But the fact that they're still in your network means that they've survived it and they've got tips and tools to how they survived it. So access that powerful network that, that you have that you never knew was there. Powerful. Thank you, Stephen. And yes, I have lots of ideas all the time. So you get to hear some of my ideas too. <laughs> this was so lovely. Okay, I'm going to add just like two little things. 
and Nadis has put in the chat um, a summary of what you shared. But every Black History Month, as you know, I'm an equity speaker. I'm always asked to speak on things. So I eventually decided I'm going to travel every single February. And this is what I've been doing for the last couple of years. So if you can travel, that's great. But I think what the issue is or what was what I needed was I needed to be in spaces where I was like welcomed, where I was seen, where I was like part of something, part of a community. And so this year we tra I had the privilege of traveling to Grenada and just being in that space. And that was healing for me, being able to touch the ocean, the sand, to like listen to music that, you know, that I love and to just be with the people as, as much as you shared today too, right? Um, and it's also about black excellence. You know, there's so much richness within our culture, within our identity that we don't often tap into or love or enjoy. And so having those moments are like gold for me. Every year, Caravana, I don't care what people say about stormers, it is my safe space. It is my space where I'm like, I'm free. And so being in spaces that you feel free, um, as Crystal talks about, being those spaces where you're affirmed, your identity is affirmed, where you get to rest um, is really important. Um, and maybe that's the final word is around the importance of rest, right? How do we embed rest in our journey? Um, because we can't always hold all these issues that we deal with on a daily basis. I'm so honored to have all of you here today, just to taking the time out of your day, the time out of your life to be able to speak with us. And I understand and respect the toll that it takes, you know, telling our personal stories, um, bringing up things that have happened in our past, and also talking about something that we're really passionate about. So I, I just want to thank you all today for, for doing that. For Maggie, who provided a beautiful blessing and an opening for our day, thank you so much. I never want to have the last word, so I want to give an opportunity to my amazing panelists to kind of share maybe what's your call for action and um, maybe a blessing for the people in the audience today in terms of what you hope for them as well. I'd say maybe just to keep showing up for each other. Um, we had the Black History Month event um, at Chestnut um, Recreation Center, um, and it was well attended for all intents and purposes, because there were, you know, up to a hundred people. Ford Fest has thousands of people, right? Like let's start showing up for okay. events that Nicole's holding, that DFCC is holding, and by the thousands, because there are thousands of us in Durham. And that is gonna allow these events to share information. It's gonna allow them to grow and it's gonna allow us to be with us, with us as a people, and then take and experience the joy that we bring when we're together. We are hilarious. We are like-minded. We are brilliant. When we, we are like the Power Rangers and forming when we are together. It is a vibe. So Caravan is an absolute vibe because we're together and we're celebrating each other. So just to for everyone to look out for the events that are happening um, next week, March break, just that Durham One is doing their March break camp all week. Um, there is basketball tournaments, guest speakers, um, employment opportunities for young people. It's a music DJs are, are going to be there. Great food. It's a chance for us to be together. So let's take those opportunities and be together as one. Well. Oh, Stephen, if you have a link, let me know. I'll put it in the chat. And I just also did a plug in for the Kajanga Wellness Fair, which is on May 26th. That's another vibe. Please come out. Natasha, thank you for being here. What do you want to share? Well, thank you for having me again. Um, I think just to end off, you know, somebody touched on earlier about how we often, I think Stephen had talked about how we often keep pushing, we put our mental health lower and lower on the list. So just a reminder that your mental health matters and that, um, as Crystal said, recognize we are connected mind, body, and spirit. And so when you're looking at your mental health, you can't disconnect from one party and say that you're properly addressing your mental health. So that's the other part too, for anybody who's looking for a therapy or a service, I, you know, if that really matters to you, check if they're, they're actually in that understanding. 
but just a reminder that your self matter, those check-ins with yourself, ask yourself, am I okay? And it's okay if the answer is no, but then if the answer is no, pursue options to, to get some support. just want to leave with a quote but first I want to say this chat Nicole your team is on top of it <laughs> like just the I was like how are you getting these summaries so quickly oh my goodness no. it's amazing <laughs> uh, okay so I want to leave with a quote by Audrey Lord as like as everyone was speaking this is what was in my heart is that um caring for myself is not an act of self-indulgence it's self-preservation and that is an act of political warfare and you know when we the whole see i feel like theme of our conversation has been yes it's personal but it's deeply political and that's why we have to make it personal and i think that quote just encapsulates you know we are taught to feel guilty for resting we are taught that we need to earn our rest we are taught that it is a luxury and it is in a colonial society but as as a peoples i want to bless and encourage and remember that we have been working for way too long. We have been travailing for way too long. We have been surviving for way too long. This is your time to rest. There is freedom in rest. There is liberation in rest. There is resistance in rest, resistance to a colonial capitalist society that wants, that depends on our exhaustion. And so I think Audrey Lord just invites us into a type of warfare that depends on our rest and depends on our peace. And so center the spaces that bring you joy, center the spaces that bring you rest, center the spaces that bring you the most beautiful forms of freedom. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Please put your contact information in the chat for our remaining guests who are here. And I'm looking for the title, Rest is Our Resistance. I hope I have it right. Rest is Resistance. I found it by Trisha Hershey. There. And Nadis, you want to close us off for this evening? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much our, to our panelists and to Nicole for being our moderator tonight. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed our panel today. It was very, very informative to me. So I don't know about y'all, but I had a good time. <laughs> but um, I'm just going to share my screen really quick just to show like our upcoming events i don't know nicole if you wanted to do that i don't know if i have um permission to but i just wanted to show like the last two slides about okay. our upcoming events should be able to okay all right give me one second to do this then okay can we see that yep okay wait how do i present mode is it no the like little arrows at the bottom beside the 40 percent oh there we go okay thank you <laughs> All right, so um, our next panel, or I guess event, will be on Tuesday, March 5th from, this is, I think this is, oh, it goes till 10 p.m., I'm guessing. Oops. Clearly, I'm not very good at sharing my screen. Okay. <laughs> I yeah, so we have... forgot to mention that we have a great youth program it's um, called the Adrinka Youth Leadership Program. It's a program that we started in September, which supports young people to do amazing things in their community. We provide them a grant of $2,500, no strings attached, but just gives them an opportunity to go out and make some changes in their community. And we're gonna showcase the work that they're doing. So that is the program showcase workshops. Hopefully you can attend to see what some of our young change makers are coming up with how to support their community. And then the grieving through loss, that's gonna be on Friday, because I had something come up. So that'll be Friday at noon. And then what else we got? We also have our Lunch and Learn webinar, which will be on Wednesday. And that is at noon as well, I believe. Mm -hmm. it goes to 3 p.m. And yeah, so this is our little QR code here. 
you can scan it and it will bring you to Kajenga's Eventbrite. So I'll give you a few seconds to, to do that if you haven't already. But I think I, I also put the link in the chat too, so maybe you already have it. But I'll give you a few seconds anyways. Yes, our next uh, Adrinka Youth Showcase will be on the 6th and it starts at uh, 6.30. So it's open to the public as well. Okay, I think I'm gonna go to the next one now. I hope everyone got the QR yeah. code. Right. Okay, awesome. And we just ask you to please connect with us, please become a partner, facilitate, we can work together. Um, this is our QR code for feedback. So it'll just bring you to a little Google Doc. You can fill it out, give us some feedback, what we need to work on, what, what you thought was good, what you want to see more of, all that good stuff. So leave that up for a few seconds. But yeah, that's, that wraps up our night. Thank you so much you. for joining us. Thank you. Wishing everyone a restful evening. Don't forget to rest. And thank you again for joining us. We'll see you this rest of the week. And if you sent your email, I will email you like soon. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Bye.